Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Right now on Indiana News Desk, I-69 exists in disconnected pieces across eight states and linking those sections is difficult because federal legislation didn't attach funding to the project when it was approved. I think the days of the endless bucket of money and the government are gone and we have to find ways to work together to get things that we all want. We've all got to put money in. Ahead, how Indiana's neighbors want to work together to finish I-69 from Mexico to Canada. The number of advanced placement exams Indiana students are taking each year has nearly doubled since 2008. But while the number of students enrolling in AP courses has increased, the percentage of Indiana students passing AP exams has slipped. But then they're going and taking the test, and they're not putting any effort into it at all. Those stories and a look at the week's top headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, this is Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The Indiana Legislative Delegation split its vote this week on the budget deal to end the government shutdown and raise the debt ceiling. Both Indiana Senators Joe Donnelly and Dan Coates voted in favor of the measure. So did Representatives Pete Fiskloski, Susan Brooks, Andre Carson, and Todd Young. The rest of Indiana's delegation, all Republicans, voted against the deal. But the agreement only keeps the government funded until January. And former Congressman Lee Hamilton says he doesn't expect much to change the next time around. Every situation is a little bit different. And it may be the politicians will have drawn some from lessons from all of this, but that remains to be seen. At this point, uh, it would seem to me that we would be headed for another crisis. Hamilton says politicians shouldn't try to score political points with self-made self crises, and Hoosiers, whether Republican or Democrat, need to tell their representatives that doing so is unacceptable. Construction of Interstate 69 is continuing in Indiana, although not at quite the pace it was under Governor Mitch Daniels. The road is supposed to connect eight states through the middle of the country from Michigan south to Texas. But right now it only exists in pieces. And as Sarah Whitmire reports, only three states are actively working to build the road. In south central Indiana, bulldozers and land movers clear the way for what will be I-69. This 27-mile stretch from Crane Naval Center to just south of Bloomington is expected to be complete by the end of next year. But even then, I-69 will still exist in two disconnected pieces in Indiana. The road from Indianapolis north to Michigan opened in 1971, and Governor Mitch Daniel celebrated the completion of the road from Evansville north to Crane about a year ago. This scene looks a lot like something that happened in Kentucky a couple years ago. It was a proud moment, that moment on October 25, 2011, when I stood with the Federal Highway Administrator, Victor Mendez, at Southside Elementary School in Nortonville and unveiled the first red, white, and blue Interstate 69 shield. Like Indiana, Kentucky has been moving full speed ahead on I-69 construction. Of course, it's been easier with our neighbors to the south. They're not paving a new interstate. They're updating existing roads to interstate standards, which is much cheaper and faster. Nonetheless, the state has about 55 miles of the road finished. But now leaders there are faced with the same problem as many of the road advocates in southwestern Indiana. We're looking at different options on funding for this bridge. It has to be a long-term effort. It has to be involving the bi-state bridge, of course, in, in Indiana is very important. The bridge is a critical, uh, you know, there's that geographical impasse that we have, the Ohio River. and. Louisville's got two bridges that are in, in the hopper. Uh, Northern Kentucky's got a bridge they're working on. Uh, they're currently rebuilding a bridge in Western Kentucky. So we know that we're, you know, 
toward the back of the line. But if we don't keep applying pressure for that bridge, it's easy to think, well, that money could be used here and there and everywhere else. A span across the Ohio River is estimated at $1.2 billion. And where that money is going to come from is a big question. This week, officials in Kentucky and Indiana announced a new collaboration called BridgeLink. The team plans to lobby leaders in Washington and in state capitals to help secure funding for the bridge, with the goal of completing it in eight years. For decades, the argument in Indiana has been that the southwestern corner of the state needed a way to connect to Indianapolis. With construction scheduled to meet State Route 37 late next year, Evansville is now focusing on the last piece of the puzzle, finishing the road to the south. You know, Henderson and Evansville are really two medium-sized metropolitan areas for here, and it's critical for both of them to have uh, traffic going back and forth. Uh, they already have a great deal of commerce exchanged across the riverbanks, uh, but as traffic comes up from the south and comes down from the north, you know, Michigan and Texas and all points in between, that's just going to, you know, explode. The, the opportunities for uh, trading, uh, for tourism, is just going to grow exponentially, and that bridge is really critical. The pot of money Daniels used to fund I-69 construction is gone or committed. And in Kentucky, the money Governor Bashir allocated in his six-year transportation plan is only enough to cover improvements to the corridor, not to construct a new bridge. Some have already begun calling I-69 a road to nowhere. Last month, 8th District Congressman Larry Bouchon helped establish a bipartisan congressional caucus aimed at accelerating I-69 projects such as the bridge. But he said it's unlikely funding for the project will come from the federal government. The days of the endless bucket of money and the government are gone. And we have to find ways to work together to get things that we all want. We've all got to put money in. Some plans have called for Kentucky to put in two-thirds of the money and Indiana to pitch in the remaining third. Other ideas include public-private partnerships where investors would pay for some of the costs up front or making the bridge a toll bridge. Kentucky is accustomed to tolls. Three of its parkways were tolled and once the construction bonds were paid off, the tolls were removed. But it could be a tougher sell in Indiana where Governor Mitch Daniels was forced to back off of the tolling option in the southwestern part of the state because it was so unpopular even among road supporters. And Sarah Whitmire joins us for more. Your story in Kentucky seems a lot like what we've been covering in Indiana over the yeah. past few years. It's funny, isn't it? You yeah. can see a lot of the same threads going through both stories. Mm -hmm. in southern Indiana and the southwestern part of the state, it's all about economic development, the same thing in western Kentucky. They're saying that their livelihoods in these communities depend on getting the road finished. And right now they can see that I-69 is there, but connecting the two, and until they're connected, mm -hmm. you know, it's very obvious they're not getting the full potential of what the road would bring. What are the big differences, though, between the two states? Yeah, so the big thing is Kentucky is updating existing roads to interstate standards, whereas we all know that Indiana is building new roads. So the money that Kentucky needs to come up with is a lot less than the money that Indiana needs to come up with. Kentucky's entire budget for I-69 is about $150 million. Indiana, by comparison, conservative estimates are $3 billion. So mm. that's something like mm -hmm. 20 times more money needs to be raised in Indiana to build this bridge. So that's really the big the big difference. Lots of money, uh, tolls in the future for I-69? I mean, it seems likely. We're hearing a lot of conversations about tolling, but I think in order to answer that question, you really have to step back and say, what is the likelihood I-69 is going to get finished? You know, when I-69, I think it was back in 2007, it was designated as one of the six corridors of the future. But that designation was quickly stripped away when a number of states stopped construction because when I-69 was approved, the federal government didn't attach any funding to it. So a lot of states really saw it as this unfunded mandate. And, you know, they saw traditional sources of funding drying up, namely the gas tax. And then with no federal money, they didn't know where the money was going to come from. And it was really the same thing that Governor Mitch Daniels inherited when he became governor, he didn't want to be like all the governors before him that didn't do anything with I-69. So as you know, he leased the toll road and used that money to start I-69 construction. 
But now Indiana's in the same boat as these other states because we don't have another toll road to lease. So are we going to do public-private partnerships and toll it? Or, or what is the other plan? You know, and, and Daniels, of course, was adamant that he wasn't going to toll the first three sections. But Pence has said maybe the other sections will be tolled. Okay. Well, a lot more to talk about. And I'm sure there will be more coming Absolutely. up in the future. Thanks very Thanks. much, Sarah. And now we go over to Alex Dierkman for a look at this week's top stories. Alex, interesting news in the continuing fight in the Tipton County wind farms? Yes, Joe, and more on that story coming up. But first, the U.S. Supreme Court announced this week it will hear a case brought by Indiana along with 11 other states challenging the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. The EPA requires new power plants to apply for permits to emit greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. The lawsuit argues that policy violates the Clean Air Act. That puts heavier burdens on Indiana coal industry, which is among the top 10 largest in the nation. Indiana University Maurer School of Law professor Jim Barnes says there's slightly more than a 50-50 chance the Supreme Court will rule in favor of the EPA, but this certainly isn't the last lawsuit the EPA will face over its climate policies. This is one of a series of, of decision steps in what what this country and indeed the world is going to do uh, about the uh, buildup of uh, uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. The High Court will hear the case during the current session but has not set a date for when arguments will be heard. 45 percent of Indiana fast food workers or 20,000 employees are on public assistance. That's slightly lower than the national average according to a study released this week from the University of California Berkeley Labor Center. Researchers told a frontline, looked at frontline employees who weren't managers and said the workers' low wages place costs on the public while the fast food industry makes a marginal profit. According to the report, 12% of Indiana's fast food workers are on Medicaid, 17% have children in the, children in the Children's Health Insurance Program, and 18% are on food stamps. The Tipton County Plan Commission is recommending the county pass tougher restrictions for wind farms. But as Josh and Lynn reports, the commission this week stopped short of approving an outright ban. Let's start at the beginning. It's January 2013, and UV Wind has just proposed a new wind farm to be built in Tipton County. The time is right. Favorable polls, wind energy tax credits, and another company is already constructing a wind farm in the same county. Not so fast, said some Tipton residents. In our case, um, there's a couple of us at least weren't necessarily opposed to wind farms in general. It's just we were surprised given the number of houses that were in the community that they would even consider putting a wind farm in our area. In this case, they were going to put, there were going to be 11 of them within a mile of my house. I would be completely surrounded. Tipton County officials added new restrictions to the wind ordinance in May and UV filed an amended proposal at that time but the fight has kept going. At Wednesday's meeting, the plan commission voted to increase setback requirements to at least 2,640 feet from property lines. To put that into context, it's only 1,000 feet in many other counties. Even new restrictions don't satisfy opponents who have called for an outright ban on future wind development, citing scientific studies on health, noise, and decreasing property values. But proponents of wind turbines cite studies of their own. We do not experience the noise that they're talking about. Most of the time we hear nothing. We lay in bed at night with our windows open and we try to hear them and we can't. Meanwhile, the existing wind farm has signed contracts with Tipton County and will be grandfathered in with the old restrictions. It's a bit more complicated in UV's case. They sued the county last month. If they win, they get grandfathered in too. If they lose, they will have to reapply under the newest restrictions. The Plan Commission will give its recommendation to the county commissioners who will then decide whether to enact the new restrictions for future development. Indiana is poised to lose more than $60 million it was supposed to get from a landmark tobacco settlement in the 1990s. That is money that was supposed to be used for health programs across the state. Indiana was among 46 states that reached a settlement with the four largest tobacco companies in 1998. The settlement is supposed to pay out more than $200 billion over 25 years. Indiana has received nearly $2 billion so far. According to the ruling, Indiana hasn't tried hard enough to collect money from the companies that aren't part of the original settlement. The ruling will cost the state nearly half of the $131 million it was supposed to receive next year. The Indiana Attorney General's office says it will appeal the ruling. 
Former Secretary of State Charlie White is appealing his guilty verdict on voter fraud. White was sentenced to one year of home, of home detention. He's blaming his lawyer Carl Brizzy for a weak defense and is suing him for legal malpractice, largely based on the fact that he did not let White testify. White was convicted last year of six felonies, three counts of voter fraud, two counts of perjury, and one count of theft. White is scheduled to testify next week when the case resumes. Peregrine falcon is no longer on the state's endangered species list. The bird was removed from the federal list in 1999 and state officials removed it from their list this week. Habitat loss and pesticide use almost wiped out the falcon population in the 1960s, but Indiana wildlife officials began trying to reintroduce the bird in the early 1990s. Joe? Thank you very much, Alex. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. The Hoosier State Line is funded to continue for at least a year, but without improvements. What Amtrak officials are doing to improve service and boost ridership. And an increasing number of students are not passing AP exams. How state educators plan to boost state scores. Those stories coming up on Indiana News Desk. It makes me angry and it makes me want to voice it. Frontline provides me with information that makes me think we have to be informed. I'm going to see truth from a lot of different sides. I trust Frontline. Once I have the truth, I want to communicate that truth. That's where change begins. It's a current that comes through my mind and says, there's a new direction here and we have to move in it. Frontline. We can make a difference. PBS kicks off the weekend with Charlie Rose and America's top newsmakers on his new series, Charlie Rose, The Week. Some people say, well, you know, Obama was this raving liberal before, now he's you know, Dick Cheney. Recap the week's biggest stories and Charlie's best interviews. You feel there's this incredible synergy between the audience and, and the performer, and time slows down. And get a look at the week ahead. Charlie Rose, The Week. Check local listings. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. An update now to a story we've been following for several weeks. It was down to the wire, but Amtrak and the state reached a deal this week to keep service on the Hoosier state line going for at least a year. But the plan doesn't call for any improvements. Now, some say continuing to fund the status quo is a mistake. More than half of the money for the $2.5 million agreement will come from communities along the route. But members of a legislative panel say Indiana should not move forward with long-term funding of the Hoosier State Passenger Rail Line until Amtrak provides a plan to improve service. Make your product quality and competitive so that this is a good investment for the state. Give us a more viable business plan. That's all we're asking. The Hoosier State Line, which runs between Indianapolis and Chicago, carried a little more than 36,000 riders last year. A report released last month indicated improvements to the line could cost $230 million and would result in increased ridership. A spokesperson for Amtrak says his company has been working with other Midwestern states in recent years to make the sort of improvements Indiana could explore. Both state officials and Amtrak say the one-year deal will allow time for both sides to explore ways to improve service and boost ridership. And now we turn to a story on education. The number of advanced placement exams Indiana students are taking each year has nearly doubled since 2008. Those who get a passing score not only get a step closer to earning the state's honors high school diploma, they earn college credit. But while the number of students enrolling in AP courses has increased, Kyle Stokes reports the percentage of Indiana students passing AP exams has slipped. 25.2. Okay. Yeah. For advanced placement teachers, the off-season is short. As your AP teacher, I'm your coach. Just weeks after this year's classes end and students take their tests. You're my team. I have the playbook. They start drawing up a game plan for next year's opponent, Four. the AP wow. exam. So we're going to look at this as this is our opposition. So we need to figure out 
how we can tackle that. Get a 9331 fit. Ten months before this year's AP tests, about 300 teachers from across the Midwest spent part of this past summer at Ball State going over the X's and O's of AP courses. It's part of a summer institute where teachers learn how to teach college level classes to high school students. There's guidance for teachers who are new to advanced placement or for teachers like Danielle Tooley, who's taught AP English literature for several years. But this year, she's adding another course, AP English language, to her teaching load. We need to do what we can to provide practical experiences for our students for them to be successful in some kind of post-secondary program, whether it's a traditional four-year college or what have you. Here's how it works. Students sign up for an AP course in the fall, and each May, the College Board administers national AP exams. If students earn a three or better on the test's five-point scale, they've passed, guaranteeing students credit at Indiana's public colleges. Educators say it's one way to make college a little more affordable and seem a little more accessible. We're making them aware that they are ready for college and careers. Many students don't know that they are, and they never had a dream that they were gonna go to school. But once they see that they can be successful in this level, they find a way to make it. Indiana lawmakers want more students taking AP exams. They've tripled the amount of state money available this year and next for AP testing. State dollars now cover the cost of any AP test in a math or science subject. The number of exams students have taken nearly doubled between 2008 and 2012, but the percentage of advanced placement exams on which students earned passing scores of 3, 4, or 5 hasn't kept pace. Less than half of the exams received high enough scores to earn college credit for the Indiana students who took them in 2012. If they want to count AP courses toward academic honors on their high school diploma, students have to pass the class and they do have to take the final AP test. But they don't have to score well on the test. And that has been, um, I think, a less than well thought through policy coming out of the state. Another result, one of the last countries in the world to still have polio. AP European history teacher Matt Hoagland says he hears a lot of complaints from fellow advanced placement instructors that more students are showing up in their classes, but they aren't all ready for AP level work. A significant number of kids are taking the AP class and they're learning a lot of good stuff from that, and that's fine. But then they're going and taking the test and they're not putting any effort into it at all. And so there's been an explosion of ones out of five that have really lowered scores. I'm truly hopeful and believe that what we may just simply be dealing with are growing pains. Derek Rettelman with the Indiana Chamber of Commerce says it's not time to hit the panic button yet. He's encouraged to see increases in the number of students willing to take on more challenging coursework. We are getting more students to enroll in AP and that's a good thing because it's it gets them into more rigorous coursework. Um, but uh, it appears that we need to do more work to, to achieve the higher pass rates that we all want. Look to schools with successful advanced placement programs, Rettelman says. There, Indiana educators might find game plans for boosting the state's pass rates on AP exams. But there are other opportunities for students to earn college credit in high school besides AP. International Baccalaureate, or IB, is one option that offers a similar year-end exam for college credit. Then there are dual credit offerings where high schools partner with colleges to offer courses for both high school and college credit. Now here in the studio is Mike Beam, who runs the Advanced College Project. It's a dual credit program Indiana University offers to more than 100 schools across the region. Thanks for being here. So students who pass a course through your program actually get IU credit and a transcript, correct? That's correct. And, uh, and with more than 350 schools, 4,000 students, I believe uh, Kyle passed along some information here. How do you make sure that all the courses um, actually that you're teaching are worth the IU credit that the students are getting? That's a great question. Well, actually, the Advanced College Project is in about 160 schools across the state, and we'll enroll about 12,000 students this, this school year. We've worked for the past 30 years, honestly, with high schools, and what we do is we, we uh, train very high-qualified high school teachers um, to deliver specifically an IU course. These teachers spend a lot of time with IU faculty, IU faculty who have um, either direct uh, control or instruct the course on campus themselves. 
And so what the high school teacher is doing in the high school setting is delivering calculus or composition or U.S. history. So it's not an equivalency with the ACP program like AP is. It's actually delivery of an IU course just in a different setting. Now the AP has kind of a be-all, end-all test um, at the end. Does the dual credit also have something like that at any point? The, the, the course, because it's an IU course, may have an end of a course assessment. Let's say uh, if, uh, calculus is a great example. Um, when we deliver a calculus course at Batesville High School or Bloomington South, uh, the math teacher in that, teaching that, that version of M211 will use the same on-campus midterm and final exams that we use in calculus. So in that case, it's very similar in terms of a test. But other courses on, on IU campus that wouldn't have an end of a course assessment that's one be-all test like AP, we wouldn't, rep, we wouldn't invent that in the high school setting. The high, school's, the high school course, when it's offered in the high school, our intention is to deliver as we would on campus. So if there's no omnibus big test at the end of the course on the campus, there's not one when it's offered in the high school. So then is it up to the discretion of the teacher? To a very small degree, the teacher is the teacher designs the syllabus in conjunction with the IU faculty members. So the syllabus must match an, what would be an IU syllabus on campus. There's some variation. Schools meet much more many more days than we do on campus, but but primarily it's the IU syllabus. Thank you very much for your perspective. Appreciate you being here today. Yes. Okay. And before we end this week, a note of congratulations to our state impact colleagues. Kyle Stokes and members of the WFIU WTIU team were in New York this week for the Edward R. Murrow Best in Journalism reception. State Impact Indiana picked this up first place in the radio documentary category for the 2012 Special Progress Report and included discussion of standardized tests, teacher evaluations, merit pay, and school choice. A record number of entries were submitted this year, and only a handful of public media stations in the country were recognized. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online at WTIUnews.org. For all of us here at WTIU, have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you.